if you are a responsible reviewer, your goal is to convince people that this hobby is worthwhile and having good, inexpensive knives, whether they're the $200, $250 Shemweary or the $20 Pilar, that is what we should be doing as, as people that speak up for the hobby. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 126 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies. Anybody who likes knives, well, you're in the right place. You get to learn about knives and knife collecting, hear from the designers, the makers, the manufacturers, or the reviewers, anyone involved in the knife industry, anyone who loves knives. That's what the Sunday interview show is all about. And Bob, today's interview comes from someone that was because of an article you read. That's right. Uh, Anthony um, from Everyday Commentary, he's been on my radar for years. Uh, He's been doing reviews and and like that. But he wrote an article recently about how the EDC market, uh, chief among uh, that market, knives and such, but how all this would fare uh, into the future uh, and how COVID-19 and our current pandemic situation is going to affect that market. And I thought it was very, uh, it seemed very honest and very well uh, thought out and analyzed. And I wanted to talk to him about it. I was expecting that the article would would make some folks bristle just because he said some things that are not, uh, uh, you know, necessarily good news. But I mean, uh, oftentimes good news doesn't (laughs) come out of a pandemic. So I wanted to get him on the show and talk to him. And it was it was great to talk to him about the article, but just so many other things. He's a he's a brilliant guy. And his uh, perspective and his analysis of gear, I just really respect. We'll get into that uh, interview in just a sec, but I do want to let you know that our podcast today is uh, sponsored in part by the Get Upside app. It's uh, your way to get cash back on gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you just put on your smartphone whenever you need to get gas. You search for your area for savings, claim that discount, fill up your tank, then you just take a picture of the receipt with your smartphone. That's it. You've just earned cash back. So go to the knifejunkie.com slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash save on gas. You know you're a knife junkie if you plan your vacation around Blade Show. I'm here with Anthony Schoolambrini, and he is known as Everyday Commentary. Anthony, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. No problem. Uh, we were just talking, and uh, I was mentioning how um, you recently caught my eye with your with your latest article, or at least the latest article that I saw called "How the COVID nineteen Will Change the EDC Market." I put the in front of COVID nineteen, like I'm like I'm ninety years old. How COVID nineteen will change the EDC market? And uh, wow, what a captivating read it was! And I would imagine uh, it it set off a couple of fireworks here and there. Yes. So tell me about it and, and tell me about this like delightfully honest uh, uh, look at, at reality. Well, so what had happened was um, Nick, Nick Shabazz and I do a podcast called uh, Gear Geeks Live. And it is not as regularly produced as yours because up until very recently, I've had house guests. Uh, and so we were talking about how things would change uh, when COVID hit. We recorded it probably the beginning of April. And, you know, it was it was one of those things that and I'm sure this happens to you. But like when you're preparing for a podcast, you start thinking about what you're going to talk about. And then I realized like, oh, there's there's a lot to write about here. And, you know, I try I think I have written a weekly article, at least one article every week for 10 years. And so. This was one of those ones where it came like fire and I just wrote it in probably, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, which is one of the reasons why I have really bad typos because I don't have an editor and I write like that. And so the the whole idea was thinking about like what's going to change. And I think that, you know, one of the things that was happening already in the market is that the market was slowing down. You know, if you look at the market trends for the past 10 years, 
you will see a really astronomical growth in the size of the knife market. And that's something that like all of us knife enthusiasts absolutely love. But that that sort of growth is generally not sustainable. And I, I wrote about this a long time ago in an article I published about custom knives. And it was basically pointing to the similarity between the custom knife market and the tulip craze in Holland 300 years ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so the idea in the, in the, the tulip mania was that the tulips became a status symbol. And so the more unusual and exotic and rare the tulip was, regardless of however it was made or what it did, people wanted it. And it was the it's sort of like the economist's emblem of a crazy market. And I thought that, you know, like the custom market had really reached a saturation point. And if you listen to like, um, uh, what's, what's, uh, Mark Steiner's podcast called? Jesus. Mark of the Maker. Uh, yeah. They were already talking about, you know, like the, the market sort of slowing down and contracting. And that was before COVID hit. And it was just sort of a natural extension. Like if you lose your job, uh, due to COVID and instead of having an income of 40 or $50,000 a year and you have an income of zero, you're probably not going to be looking at custom knives anymore. And you're probably not going to be looking at high end production stuff anymore. And you might not be buying any gear at all. And if that's the case, what happens to the market? You know, like if, if a third of the knife buying public has severe restrictions on their hobby spending, what would happen to that boom market? And so that's what gave rise to the article, which really surprisingly had some serious pushback. I, I, you know, I read every comment on my website and I respond to every comment on my website. And, uh, you know, by and large, the people that, that read my, my website, they've, They've been the same, you know, five or 6,000 people a week since the beginning. And so I pretty much know all the commenters and all the commenters know me and I've emailed with all of them. And, you know, it's not unusual. But then, you know, like I published this and one of the things that's happening is that I forget which one, but one of the knife magazines is just re republishing links to like, you know, they'll have a headline. And it'll summarize my article, and then it will publish a link to my article, which is fine. I mean, it's just Knife magazine, I think. Yeah, it's just the just the way that the internet works. I don't really care. Um, but that seemed to attract a different population of people, and they were really mad. And I just couldn't – like one of the guys said, what is this smack? You need to be punched in the dick. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh my God. I don't even know. Like, I, I don't know what I said that was offensive. I mean – Well, I, I was going to ask you, aside from those kind of like – uh, not very uh, articulate uh, rebuttals. What, what what kind of things were people saying to you? I mean, what kind of complaints could they have had? I read it and I was like, oh, I, I hate to hear this for these certain guys or these, these certain areas of the market that might be suffering. But, you know, why not face reality? You know, I think a lot of people were just upset about, and this happens all the time, you know, like whenever you put put knife makers into different stratus or different tiers people always get upset because they like want to argue that their favorite knife maker is in a different tier and and you know like i don't think that i could make a definitive list but i think that it's probably safe to say that like michael walker's in that top tier no matter what like if you don't agree with that then either you don't know who michael walker is or you don't know anything about knives so you're saying super 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 high-end luxury fantastically jeweled uh folding knives yeah and if you look at things like uh before i b when i was in grad school i worked at a high-end audio store and we sold wilson's wilson audio speakers i don't know if you know what those are i remember yeah yeah and so like one of the guys that bought the speakers from our place was bob Kraft. he owns the new england patriots like people that are wealthy enough to buy wilson audio speakers or wealthy enough to own uh, you know, and be in the market for a brand new Michael Walker, they're at a point in their life financially where they're sort of immune to any of the, the travails that us regular folks have. So, you know, I just took that same logic and said, like, you know, Walker's going to be fine. Cause if you're, if you're, you know, buying a Walker, you, you might have a yacht or something. So like, who really cares? But then, you know, like the guys that are, and I don't mean to say that like they're lesser makers, but they just charge less money for their knives. Right. You know, if you look at like a guy like Todd Rexford, Todd Rexford makes amazing, amazing knives, 
but he, they're not priced the same way a Michael Walker is. And so I said basically like, he'll be fine too, because the difference in terms of your financial well-being, if you're buying a $100,000 knife and a $10,000 knife, isn't really that different. I mean, these are all luxury items. One is more expensive, but it's sort of like saying like, well, I could afford a cheap Ferrari or I could afford the Ferrari La Ferrari, right? You're also, you're also dealing with uh, makers who have fervent collectors or, or at least stable markets of their own. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I think that by and large, and that's what I said in the article that the, the tier below in terms of pricing, like the Todd Rexford tier below that, those guys might survive. And I think that's true if they have like a really fervent following. But there's also a possibility that some of those guys in that tier below won't survive. And I, I think that that's a really terrible thing because, you know, just from my, my local perspective and going to the custom knife shows in New England, a lot of the guys that are in that tier below in terms of price, they're making some really crazy, innovative, awesome stuff. And if we lose them, that would be really, really bad. I mean, I, I'm thinking about like, um, do you know that I forget what the name of the Gerber knife is, but the pivot is a hollow tube and you hold it by the pivot and you open it. Yes. Yes. That's been around for a, a long while. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the guy that invented that actually always goes to the New England Cutlery Collectors Association show. And there are a couple other guys there that have invented really crazy knives. You know, like Barry Wood used to go to that show before he died. And the one of the guys that followed after Barry Wood is still making his knives. The guy that um, designed the real thin credit card knives for SOG, he goes to that show. And, like, that's innovation. Yes. I- innovators aren't always on the upper tier because they're they're kind of scrapping to get recognized. You right. Know, they're struggling in obscurity until they, they hit upon their, their huge, you know, take. And if we lose those people, that really would be a, uh, you know, that would be a blow to this market. Yeah. I mean, think about it like this. So the guy that invented the axis lock is a guy named William McHenry. He and his, um, I think it's his stepson, Jason, they, they developed that lock and they sold it to Benchmade and they weren't selling their knives. And, they, and by the way, they're from Rhode Island. So they're kind of local to me. They weren't selling their knives for $10,000. And the same thing is true of the Hawks. Like if you think, if somebody asked me like gun to my head, who's the most innovative knife maker, the Hawks would probably be the first name. And they're not selling $10,000 knives. I think they'll be fine because they have a following and they have connections to big companies. But that kind of innovation is really at threat here. And I, you know, and in the article, which I don't understand why people got mad, but I really made a point to say, you got to go support these folks, you know, and I, I'm, I'm worried that like if these folks are depending on Blade Show, you know, blade blade's still happening, but I don't know how long that will be, and I don't know what the attendance will be like. And so, you know, like how do we as a community sort of rally around and protect innovation when the economy is not happening? You mentioned in the article a shared risk sort of scenario where um, you know knife makers could share cost either of just day to day necessities like insurance or also. You know, maybe uh, we've spoken a bit on this podcast about collective style, and I don't mean socialistic, but sort of collective, collective style um, OEM kind of uh, right, situations right. happening in the United States. Um, what what of that? What of what about uh, things being made in this country now more because of what's happening? I I totally think that that would be a great outgrowth of COVID. I'm not sure exactly what that would look like, but again, I'm just talking locally. Like I went in December and I visited Three Rivers Manufacturing with my son and we did a shop tour and that place is amazing. Like people do not understand how good those people are. Like Marion and Les and the guys that work for them, they are really good at making knives. And, you know, if it came out of COVID that because of, you know, we're, restrictions on on trade or restrictions on shipping that instead of going to Rayot for uh OEM work they went to like a local manufacturer like TRM or like Protec or some other small operation that has the capacity that that in my mind would be a, a boon i mean i don't have anything pro- any anything wrong with Rayot i'm just saying like 
kind of root for the home team. You know, I, I have, I have a rayat knife right here, right now. It's the, the Sharp by Designs, uh, Micro Evo. And it's a great knife. They make fantastic stuff. And all things being equal, I will still buy knives made overseas. I'm just saying, like, if, if a little love happens to go to, to, you know, OEMs or small manufacturers here in the United States, like, that's a good thing. Yeah. Oh, a- absolutely. Uh, I like the way you put it. It's like, you don't have anything against Riyadh, but you're rooting for the home team. That, that kind of encapsulates my, uh, kind of, uh, labored, uh, point of view these days. I'm trying to figure it out because, uh, just by taste, just by a matter of my personal taste, I like the more muscular knives. You know what I mean? I like yeah. Hingers yeah. and Emerson's and such. Yeah. And, uh, they just happen to be, uh, American made, a lot of them. So it, it just so happens that as I kind of, uh, cull some of the stuff that I don't use and try and accumulate more of the stuff or, or refine the stuff I do have, it's it's tending me back to the U.S. made brands incidentally in a way, just due to my taste. But I've also been trying to, I don't know, you know, I, I do want to support United States makers, but there is a, I, I also don't want to discriminate. What can I say? It's in my name. I'm kind yeah. of a junkie about it. So, yeah. Uh, best tech knives. You recently did a uh, a review on the on the new A Purvis knife. Best yes. tech knives. They're, they're knocking it out of the park. Their stuff is amazing. That stuff. That knife. That the Progeny MR. That knife blew me away for 138 bucks. It is really good. It's solid, solid, solid. So you talk about uh, and before we leave the article, I want to I want to touch on two of two other things. Uh, you talk about rediscovering the entry market and. Uh, I, I've been going through a little bit of rediscovery of some of my older knives that maybe I got in a in a in a fever dream, and then sort of realized I have them and and and, and figuring them out, seeing if I want them. If I so, I like that idea of rediscovering and rediscovering the entry market. What exactly were you talking about there? So the, a couple of things happened at the same time. Number one, Sog reached out to me around Shot Show, and they had said like, "Look, we're going to." move away from big box, but we're going to do so by reinvigorating our um, our entry-level line. We're going to make knives that are a little better. And so that was interesting. And that's that's like one of those moves that you, you think of like, um, like, you know, like Ford about 10 years ago started repositioning themselves as, you know, uh, almost a luxury brand. So much so that now you, you go get a, a, a Ford truck and it's like you know fifty thousand dollars um and so you know sog did that and then you look at like companies like crkt that have been doing you know entry-level knives and i'm thinking of things like the pillar where they're really really good and they're not that expensive and they're not it's not just like race to the bottom in terms of design or materials so that's happening and then covid hits and i and it's like going back again to the idea of disposable income you're going to have less disposable income. And so as a reviewer, one of the things that I wanted to do was try to highlight products that are, you know, more affordable. So like I have a QSP Parrot on my desk for review, which is like an insanely great knife for $20. Or, you know, and this is sort of branching out into other things, but the the budget uh, flashlight form, BLF, they have started collaborating with makers in a way that's almost completely unique to flashlights. Mm -hmm. And they've started producing really high-end performing flashlights for like 30, 40. And, you know, like I just got one in uh, called the – and it's it's right here on my desk. It it was 80 bucks and I got to pick everything. I got to pick the emitter, the color. They put in tritium inserts, uh, the finish. I got to pick everything. It was 80 bucks. And so if – if that kind of thing could happen in knives because of COVID, I also think that that would be good because we got to remember entry level stuff is what gets more people into the hobby. Oh yeah. And you mentioned CRKT. I mean, what a great company for offering uh, just a wide, wide variety of design at a really low cost. I mean, you know, uh, you want a knife designed by Flavio Icoma for 40 bucks? Sure. You <laughs> CRKT. Right, right. To me, that's that's their real uh, strength, and then and then they came out with the shock for seven hundred and fifty bucks, which was whoa! It was like a a bucket of cold water, and and I understand they they were um, uh, just rolling out their new uh, bolt lock or dead bolt lock. Yeah, uh, I thought they could have done it a little more gently, uh, personally, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it, it, you know, 
I'm ready for CRKT to to come out with some of these really fantastic and unique designs uh, in better materials. I was I've always been a I'm I'm more of a collector than you, uh, Anthony. Yeah, I, I do like to just have stuff to look at, to have and to hold. Yeah, and um, uh, one thing about CRKT is that, uh, like I said, they 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 just offer crazy designs within reach. So in terms of collaboration, uh, where do you come down on the line? Is it, uh, is it, is it good to have designers and makers proliferating their, their special designs out to, to the hoi polloi or should it, should it remain restricted to those who can afford it? So I think that I, I responded to one of knife critiques posts on Instagram and he basically, they basically said that, you know, like it's really stupid for, uh, custom makers to send out their products for collaboration because they're just destroying their market. And like, I think that there might be some truth to that, but I also think that there are two things that make that statement kind of incorrect. So the first thing is, unless you're Bob Loveless making a drop point hunter, your knife design probably does not have an infinite lifespan. Like at some point, it's going to fall out of favor and people are going to be like, eh, I don't like that thing anymore. Mm. So before that happens, but after you've sort of maximized your profit as a custom maker, it makes sense to go out and collaborate and produce a production version so that you can get out of that design all of the possible money. You know, like the the Gareth Bull Shimori is a perfect example. Like I, for whatever reason, I ended up with the very first one of his new generation model. Like oh, wow. I, I wrote a review of the original uh, Shimori, he read it. And then like a year later, he contacted me. He's like, I made all the improvements you want. Do you want to buy this knife? And I was like, I didn't ask you to do that, but sure. <laughs> so I bought the knife and it was fantastic. And I wrote another review and then it was like crazy. I don't understand what happened, but like a year later that, that knife was selling for like three or $4,000. And I was like, this is nuts. This is crazy. And, you know, like, I don't know if that knife's legs are gone because it's such a simple and timeless design, but having Gareth be able to squeeze out a little bit more money from all of the research and investment that he did in the original design, I, I can't see that as a bad thing for custom makers. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, I think that, that democratizing really great designs and really great knives allows people, again, more people to get into the hobby, which I think if if you are a responsible reviewer, your goal is to convince people that this hobby is worthwhile and having good, inexpensive knives, whether they're the $200, $250 Shem Weary or the $20 Pilar, that is what we should be doing as, as people that speak up for the hobby. Okay, so you said fall out of favor. You were talking about certain knife designs. This is something that I've noticed in my own um, collecting. You know, there have been periods of time where I've been just kind of wrapped up in, oh, my God, it, you know, I have to get this and I have to get that. And I buy them. And then a year later, I'm like, purple anodized. Like, <laughs> I love purple. But I mean, what was I thinking? Purple yeah. anodized is just not me, you know, when it comes to knife. And, and then I, I sell it off. And then it gets me wondering, is this just, uh, you know, fashion? Is it trend? Is it like buying bell bottoms and then being like, eh, bell bottoms aren't cool anymore? You know, it's, it is still a tool. So. You know, aesthetics, where do you come down on it? So I, I think that we say in, in like the knife or, or any other place where we have tools that have aesthetic appeal is that like we call them fashion. Like, you know, one of the things that is really common in the watch world is they disparage fashion watches. And we talk about fashion uh, in knives as if it's a bad thing. But I think that that's unfair because a lot of times things that are fashionable are emblematic of a certain time period and and seeing that can be really interesting and valuable. I mean, people do don't go to Rome to figure out how archers are built. They go to Rome because it reminds them of a specific style of architecture and and that, you know, you could call that fashion, but it's really important as human beings it's really important to see where we came from. And so I don't think it's fair to say that, you know, those old knives are bad because they're unfashionable. They're just different than what we like right now. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, uh, you started talking. I was like, oh, it's like art history. You know, you can actually learn about what was happening in the real world by looking at art through sure. art history. You know, that's sure. that's how I did it. And you could do the same thing with knives. And and 
you know, you can actually attach sentimental value to, to these things like you can many other things. But, uh, you know, that, uh, that sentimental value could actually reside in that outdated design. Oh, yeah. 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 Or you can do something like track technology. So, um, you know, one of the reasons that Horatio Pagani founded Pagani Automobile is because when he was at Lamborghini and he was the head of their materials department, he saw the potential of carbon fiber and Lamborghini was like, mm, it's just not worth going there. It's too expensive. And so he basically said, you know, I'm going to start my own com- car company and I'm going to use this really exotic high technology and I'm not just going to use it in, in little places. I'm going to do the whole car in carbon fiber. And you can see the same technology in knives. Like think about uh, LC200N. It's a steel that was developed by NASA in the 1960s. It was designed to be, uh, you know, used in a variety of applications, including ball bearings that would be exposed to salt water. And so seeing that in a knife, even if it's not the best knife steel in the world in 20 years, will tell you, like, this is the place where knife making really tried to go for the grail of making a knife steel that could do anything. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that makes your collection more interesting than if it's like, here's the latest mm-hmm. knife. Here's the next latest knife. Here's the next latest knife. I mean. It's like, you know, no one goes to a museum to just see, like, the very latest car. They go to see all the the history of a car. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny you say museum because I'm always uh, trying to remind myself I am not the curator of the DeMarco (laughs) Museum of Knives. I don't have to have a representation of every single locking mechanism. Good luck with that. (laughs) Yeah, I'm still telling myself that. Uh, So, uh, in fashion, uh, hipster knives. Does that mean anything to you, the term hipster knife? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so when James Brand uh, launched, um, Ryan from James Brand uh, reached out to me and he asked me, like, would you review this knife? And it was the original chapter knife, which if you're if you are thinking of a hipster knife, that is probably the epitome of a hipster knife, right? It's like designed to, as clickbait for shill sites. It's designed by a company that's more aware of sort of like uh, how they fit into a fashion ecosphere than how they fit into a knife ecosphere. And it's designed, uh, it, it, it does not do the form follows function. It, do, it does the other way around. You know, the, the function follows the form. Like you want this clean, squared off looking knife and then you're going to figure out a way to make it work. And so like, I don't think that that's a bad thing per se. Like, the chapter knife, the first one was a good knife, but it had some flaws. The second one is really, really unquestionably an excellent knife. And simply because it's a hipster knife or it's like a fashion knife or it looks a certain way, I don't think it's a bad thing because again, it brings different kinds of people into the knife world. You know, like guys that don't go hunting, but you know, live in Brooklyn and, and work on Wall Street and have, you know, uh, salvage jeans that are really tight. They might not really want a buck 110, but they'll definitely go for a chapter knife. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, um, at first I scoffed. That's not, you know, I couldn't make, you know, cut my way out of a bar with that. But obviously that's not the point. And, and, and uh, it took me a second, actually, uh, you know, our producer, Jim, um, and I had a spirited conversation about this online uh, on, in one of the shows where I was kind of like, uh, James Brand, blah, blah, hipster knife. And he's like, hey, wait a second. Dumbass, aren't you interested in bringing people in and getting people excited about that? Like non knife people, you know, knife people are already in this echo chamber. You know, right. you don't need to preach to them, right. but you know, bringing other people in who might have, you know, people make assumptions about your political beliefs if you're into knives, believe it or not. Sure, and and so they, you know, they might think, well, I don't want to get into knives because I want people to assume this or that about me. But when they see, oh, if this is a useful tool, just like a pen. And it doesn't matter what you believe, you still want it, still want to use it, still carry it. If that brings people in, all the better. I, I completely agree. You know, I, a lot of times when I talk to my non-knife friends, I tell them that owning a knife is the equivalent of owning a truck. Because with a truck, you'll go do things that you would never think about doing mm-hmm. with a car. And it helps you get work done. And once you carry a knife, you're like, mm, I can do this. I, I don't need to go back in to get the scissors or I don't need to you know, break this box down or I don't need to, you're just like, I can do it. I don't need to go do something else. I don't need to go get this tool. And I feel like e- e- the more that the knife community like poo poos people coming in, the more that they're sort of shooting themselves in the foot. Because again, if the last 10 years has proven anything to the knife community, it's the fact that 
the more people that are in the knife community, the better stuff we get. Right. So you, Anthony, uh, how did you get into knives? It, it says on your website you've been into gear since you were 10 years old. And and yeah, I get it. So tell, tell me your story. Ex- explain to me how you got to where you are. Okay. So my grandfather grew up in Southern Ohio. He grew up in a town called Portsmouth, Ohio, and it was right on the Ohio River. And in the 30s, there was this massive flood and then the depression came. And so they had become pretty self-sufficient. They lived just outside of town in what people in that part of the country call a holler. And his, his dad, my great grandfather, uh, supported his family through the depression making moonshine. And as a result, he had to be really self-sufficient. Like he and his brother, his brother Walt, they, uh, started a business when they were nine years old. When my, my grandfather was nine and his brother was 11 and they would drive their father's Ford truck around the county and use a winch that they had fixed that somebody had thrown away to pull cars, like old fashioned cars, because it was in the thirties out of ditches. Hmm. And when he was doing that, he always carried a knife. In fact, I still have the knife that he carried. He made a little leather slipcase for it. And, you know, like he, by the time I was born, we would go camping and he would show me how to do these incredible, incredible things with a pocket knife. Like, I mean, he would make a slide whistle with a pocket knife. Uh, uh, have you ever seen the, the, the pair of working pliers that are actually, yes. Yeah. So he, he showed me how to do that one night when we had finished fishing and we we're sitting around the These campfire. These are working pliers that you carve out of one piece of wood, right? Correct. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and so he showed me how to do that. I can't do it, but he could do it and he could do it with his eyes closed. It was really incredible. And so he was the person that showed me like, oh, this is something that I, I could use. And when I was growing up, around the same time he showed me how to do that, we lived near uh, a state wildlife preserve. And so as a 10-year-old boy, that was like the greatest thing in the entire world. And I, I bought a uh, I bought a super tinker when I was 10 years old with money that I had gotten for, uh, for Easter at a place called General Surplus in Dayton, Ohio. And that was my first real knife. And then ever since then, I've just had a knife. And it, it's been like the thing that I always had. You know, and when I work now, I'm a lawyer and I work in an office and when I everyone's like, oh, my gosh, you can't. But then like (laughs) about two weeks after they find out that I carry a knife, they're like, do you have your knife on you? I need to open this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're like, no, there's there's scissors right over there. They're like, "Mm, I'd rather use your really awesome knife. Right. Right. But that that's sort of how it started. I saw my grandfather be really self-sufficient. I mean, he was like an incredible, incredible guy. I mean, he was just, you know, like my uncle raced motorcycles professionally and he would uh i forget what do you call it there's a technique but you basically score marks into their their tires and he would do it with a hot knife he would take a, a zippo and he would burn he would heat up the blade of his knife and then he would score these marks into the tire to give them more traction and he did that and and my uncle would win over and over again so much so that like people in northern kentucky and southern ohio would ask my grandfather can you can you go do that to my to my yeah <laughs> He was a wizard with a knife and it was so inspiring as a kid to see that this like one tool enabled him to do all these different things. You mentioned your grandfather. For me, it was my grandfather. And uh, I mean, countless people that I've talked to on this show have mentioned that it was their grandfathers who got them into knives. And it was uh, for me, it was also that thing, that uh, spirit of self-reliance, you know, oh, that's all right. I got my knife. I can take care of it. And uh, that seems to be a through line. Uh, in, in all these people that I've spoken with. And it makes me think it's up to those people like yourself, myself, and these others to be that for our grandkids and make sure that, you know, that civility, that this modern day quote unquote civility that we have now doesn't drown out, uh, this kind of useful thing. That's so strange because the way that my grandfather carried a knife, it was like this was the mark of a, a civilized person. I had a tool that could let me do things. And like, he would have never thought of using it as a weapon. I mean, he treated it so gingerly and, you know, like it it was, it was such a revered tool because he used it every day. You know, he had, he had a case knife, like a 1934 case knife that he made a, a a tiny, it's a mini trapper and he made his own slip case for it. I still have that. And he also carried a buck 110, which I, I got when he died. And in fact, you know, one of the greatest joys I've had is a, uh, a knife nut is I met CJ Buck and I told him about my grandfather's oh, knife and 
it was just, I mean, like, I'm sure he's heard that story 500 million times about, you know. And it's great each time, I'm sure. Right, right. Like, my grandfather had a buck 110. He's like, okay. <laughs> he didn't do that. He was really <laughs> awesome about it. But, like, I can only imagine how many times he's had this exact same script play out in his head from hundreds of people. So uh, you mentioned that you're uh, professionally, you're a lawyer. So what what kind of intersection, is there any intersection between your interest in knives and gear? I, I don't want to, this is the Knife Junkie podcast. We're talking knives. You, you you review a wide range of gear or a wider range of gear. Anyway, how does, how do knives and your professional life intersect? So this is a really interesting thing. So when I first started work as a lawyer, I worked as a public defender, meaning I defended people who could not afford a lawyer, which is, I think, one of the true marks of a civilization, that if we treat even the worst among us, uh, you give them equal access to justice. That's the definition of a, a fair society. So I had a case when I was a brand new public defender, and my client was, uh, as, as one of my public defender friends said, my client was addicted to a boy who was addicted to heroin. Mm. And so they were walking into court. And this is all public record. She actually got charged. So it's all public record. She was walking into court with her boyfriend and her boyfriend realized like, oh, crap, I had this knife in my pocket. So he gave it to her and she put it in her purse. And when she walked through, obviously, the metal detector went off and they took the knife and it was a Kershaw leak and it popped open and they were like, oh, it's a switchblade. So I like just did a deep dive because I was a knife nut and I started litigating and I started filing motions and... I started reaching out for expert witnesses and I uh, talked to designers that worked on the speed safe and they sent me a working prototype that with a dull blade so I could do a presentation for a judge and then, you know, so on and so forth. And at the end, the, the prosecutor was just like, you know what, you've really convinced me this is too close a call. I'm not going to put somebody's uh, liberty at jeopardy for this. It, it, we're just <laughs> so done. Cool. Here. Yeah. So she didn't even have to have a trial. They just dropped the charges. It was a truly amazing outcome and it was the right outcome. And then, so that was 2004. And then I think 2007 or 2008, one of the state reps in New Hampshire where I practice law passed a law that basically legalized all different kinds of knives except for felons. And so last year, 2019, I had a client who was charged with possession of this, like a, a ton of stuff, including various kinds of knives. But the prosecutor didn't know what a switchblade was. And so we did basically the same thing. We went through this long process. I filed a motion. I quoted the 2009 amendment to the Federal Switchblade Act. I put everything on the line. And while that case did not get dropped, again, this is all public record, the sentence was basically zero. He got, he got a sentence with, that was concurrent to another case that he had. And, you know, litigating that, that was a really fun and it was very fortuitous that those cases came to me because I don't know if another lawyer would have known. I mean, I'm not tooting yeah, yeah. my own horn, but like well, that's a really weird specialty yeah. to have as a lawyer. It's a lucky, it's a lucky strike. So, uh, in your 2008 court case, did you mention as precedent your 2004 case or no? So the like, two th just, so I don't have to explain this. Just look at the old one. Let's just look at the court record. <laughs> well, that's the funny thing. I tried. I said, you know, I, I've done this before, <laughs> and I did it in this jurisdiction. You don't have to, like, believe me. Just go ask the prosecutor. He's still working. And the, the prosecutor was like, well, he's a felon. This is different. And I'm like, it's not different. It's the same thing. So, you know, like, we had this thing about brass knuckles, but it was actually a trench knife. We had this thing about a switchblade, but it was not a switchblade. It was an assisted opener. And it was like, uh, this is going to take forever. So I just, you know, finally, I was like, you know what? I'm not, you, you don't have to believe me. I'm going to write everything out. I'll send you the motion before I file it. You tell me if you think it's fair to file. And so I did that and she, you know, wasn't a hundred percent convinced. So I filed the motion and then we like almost immediately worked out a deal because, you know, like it's the law is complicated, but it's not impossible to break it apart. Uh, Anthony, I don't know if, uh, if your viewers or fans uh, know much about that, but I mean, that, that raises you up a little bit in, in terms of your hero status. That's pretty no, 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 okay. no, okay, no, no. Uh, uh, so uh, controversies in the knife world. I mean, we're talking we're talking about the law and and courts, but what about controversies? Uh, there there have been a number of them. Uh, th do you pay attention to this? Is this anything that has any bearing on what you do? Or are you strictly looking at the hardware? 
Well, you know, like I have always had the same policy as a reviewer. They're like, I just look at the thing, right? Like there's no, it, it's just, and this is something that I think ties into my beliefs about the second amendment. It's like, it's a thing, right? Like I'm not going to demonize a table saw because the table saw by, by number of accidents injures vastly more people than, you know, get injured by the knives that we use and, and collect. Uh, so like that, that kind of stuff doesn't really bother me. And, you know, like there is always like the titillation factor, but I have, I've learned over time that it's probably not worth it to get into, especially because there's like so much good stuff. Like if you look at like how the community around rallied around Robert Carter, you know, like Carter got injured in a ATV accident and within like a day there was a, a it was either a GoFundMe or Indiegogo up trying to raise money for him. If you look at things like, um, you know, the, the way that Spyderco handles licensing the thumb hole. Yeah. You know, like that's a really incredible thing. And if we focus on like, I don't know, whatever the latest controversy is, it just, it takes away from the fact that like really we do this for enjoyment. And if we're, if we're getting into like the, the name calling about like, uh, you know, the, the one that I find the, the least, the least entertaining right now is the steel stuff. You know, uh, like, <laughs> everybody is like, it has to, like, if it's not 10 V, I just don't, I don't even want, it's like, okay. <laughs> like, let's be clear here, people. Like, none of us need 10 V. We are not doing industrial chopping operations on shingles. Yes. <laughs> right? Like, so like, who cares? That's actually why I was, was fighting, uh, before when I was talking about CRKT, I, I sort of, choked back the comment about uh in better materials as if i've ever come up against the edges of 8cr 13 mov yeah. performance and like <laughs> clearly i have to move on to a different and more right right right, steel. right. You that's know. the one that i find and you know like the funny thing is like when i first started in knives i was the guy that was like it has to be the very best steel which is why i love the dragonfly and zdp 189 so much but having used knives and having talked to lots and lots of people who know way more about knives and the technical aspects of steel than I do. Uh, you know, I realized number one, Laren Thomas's statement, it's geometry cuts, not steel. That's totally true. Mm -hmm. And number two, I realized that like very infrequently do I come up against the performance limits on a given steel, whether it's, you know, a 440 C or, you know, ZDP 189. I mean, at some point you have so many knives that you'll never, never use the any one enough. Yeah. To dull it significantly. Exactly. exactly. Except for the one or two or three that I'm actually willing to use. Actually, yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, my old machete, I dull that out, you know. Yes, that is true. That I is definitely. banging that around. Yes. Uh, so your criteria for judging a knife, um, you, you've got, I mean, you go to your website, which by the way is awesome. I really like how it's laid out. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you have, it, it's clean and, and everything you want is right there. And you have a lot of reviews up there. What are your criteria for folding knives in particular? So, first of all, before we move on, I just want to give a plug. Aaron Shapiro, uh, who's another uh, well-known knife collector, he designed my website. He did a fantastic mm. job. He did a great job. Yes. Um, so, the the criteria – so, what I did was I – there are two things. The first thing was – when I was little, I read EGM, Electronic Gaming Monthly. I don't know if you're familiar, but they had, so they had a 10 point scale, which was actually a 20 point scale because they had 0.5. And I remember racing to the newsstand at Cub Foods every month to see what the latest scores were. And I just loved the idea of a numbered score. And, you know, and I, I did a lot of research before I, I put out my scoring protocols uh, about like statistical significance because you want to have a score. That means something, but at the same time, you don't want to be, able, you know, like, you don't want to, you want it to be small enough that the point differences mean something, but not so big that, like, it's a 97 versus a 98. Like, what's yeah. that? <laughs> so, that was the first influence, like, the EGM thing. And then the second thing was, when I first started, I was a forumite on uh, the EDCF, Everyday Carry Forums, and I had published a post about the 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 list of things that I looked for in a knife before I bought a knife. And I I had done like this informal scoring system for every purchase. Like our house, my wife and I, I developed this weighted scoring system for that. I did it for fantasy baseball players where I created a formula. It was like super nerdy. I did it for cars. 
And like, I have a list of, of criteria for basically everything, like TVs. It's, it's just bananas. It's like a, an affliction. And so I finally realized like, oh, I'll just simplify this and make it a scoring system. So the criteria are, are pretty simple and they sort of have like clusters. Like there's the non knife cluster, like design and fit and finish. That applies to everything. If, if it's a bad design, it's going to be a bad product. Uh, then there's the carry and the grip. So, you know, again, as, as long as I'm reviewing everyday carry gear, carry and grip are probably always going to be on there. And then there are the, the cluster of things that are specific to knives. So, for example, in a knife review, there's always going to be a score for the uh, steel, the blade shape, and the blade grind. And I think that those are really important to, to break out because going back to what Laren Thomas said, you know, it's not the, the recipe necessarily that cuts, but the, the geometry. And so, like, you know, that focus has got to be in, in any evaluation of a knife. You've got to be able to say, this is a good grind. This is a good blade shape. This is good steel. Uh, deployment method, a retention method, and then the lock. Those are the last three. And I think that those are uh, those sort of cluster together because those are really about addressing how convenient a knife is. And so, you know, deployment method is like how easy is it to open and the carry method, you know, and this is really different than carry because carry is like how it feels in your pocket, right? Like 99% of the time you have a knife you're not using. It's in your pocket. So if it doesn't carry well, it stinks. But sometimes you'll have a knife that carries really well. Like I'm thinking of like an Almar Hawk or an Almar Eagle or Talon. Uh, so it's the Eagle, the Hawk and the Falcon. And those knives all carry well. But they don't have very good pocket clips. Like I think that if you compared the pocket clip on the the, ta- the 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 Raptor line to something like the stiff version of the over the top wire carry clip on a Spyderco, mm-hmm. you'll see that like both of those knives carry well. One of them carries well because of the clip, and the other one carries well because of the knife. And so I broke that out because again, I think that's a matter of convenience. That if you're bothering to carry a folding knife, you need to know. So that's a really long-winded explanation of silliness. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's exactly – I mean, I think people go to you because of your systematic sort of methodical way of breaking uh, things down. I mean, you are the only person I know who who breaks it, carry down into the clip or the knife design, uh, you know, by definition. Yeah. And, you know – Lots of us nerds want to get that granular, man. And I think that's what your, your <laughs> oh, USP is, sir. I feel so, so silly talking about it. Like, I've never had somebody ask me that question and I've never had to articulate that. But <laughs> I, I feel like you've just revealed to the public that I'm like a crazy person. That's I, I think, fine. I think probably people know that already. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> You've revealed that yourself, sir. What, no, 438 knife reviews? Don't tell that already. <laughs> Your favorite production knife releases of – I'm going to go back as far as 2019 because we're only halfway through this insane year and, uh, you know, who knows. But what are your favorite uh, folding knives? We'll talk about folding knives right now uh, for the last year and a half, say. So. Okay. So, th- this is something that I just finished up my best knives of 2020 and I do this every year and it's basically – not a review of new stuff, but a review of like, if you were coming into the, if you were coming into knives right now, what would you buy? Mm. And uh, the, one of the things that struck me was how much of the stuff is new stuff. And I think that 2018 was a remarkably good year for knives because we got stuff like the SOG Terminus XR. We got stuff like the the Drop Gent. That, that stuff is all really good. 2019 was a lot of sprints that didn't really interest me. But 2020 has probably been as good as 2018, uh, you know, on a month to month basis. So let's see. If I had to pick five knives that were my favorite knives in the past 18 months. So the first one would definitely be the Sharp by Designs Micro Evo version two. That knife is just, it is the most splendid flipping action in the most beautiful and considered package you could possibly ask for. There are so many nice touches on that knife that really make me appreciate just how fantastic of not not a knife designer but a, a product designer like a, on an ergonomic mm-hmm. level brian nadeau is just off the charts mm-hmm. off the charts as a great as a great designer so that one would definitely be on there another one that would be on there that's sort of in that same uh grouping is uh, the enrique pena x series front flipper uh trapper or uh, the one i like better is actually the zulu spirit looks a little less gur <laughs> that knife just kills every single thing that's hot right now in knives like 
It is a little bit traditional. It has great materials. It has a great flipping action. I mean, just Enrique Pena is brilliant at capturing what people want. You know, like Steve Jobs said that you don't, you don't uh, follow a trend. You tell people what they want. And mm-hmm. Enrique Pena has really done that because up until Pena and a couple other people in that same group, you know, Romano and those guys, up until he started doing things, people were like, I hate these grandpa knives. And so, <laughs> so like he, he, him getting, you know, the tactical audience to pay attention. That's a really impressive feat. Mr. Zeitgeist. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. I also really, really like, um, the, uh, Progeny MR. That was a knife oh, that we man. just talked about. And I think that that represents something that's different in the knife market because what it is, it's a designer produced blade, meaning that, you know, Adam Purvis designed it and he had a, it had it produced overseas. It's a designer produced blade and it is a value oriented designer produced blade. You look at like Berg knives and Sharpa design and Enrique Pena, all these other designer produced blades, they're really going for like the pinnacle of, you know, high price stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, like, Adam Purvis hitting that $138 price mark with the Progeny MR is really incredible. Yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You mentioned no, no. that in your review, and 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 it really uh, hit a chord with me uh, because you mentioned the price, and I was like, $130. Uh, well, do I buy knives in that? Uh, like, I either get them cheap or expensive, and I was like, $130 for that design. I mean, it's a cool, especially in that green micarta, oh. um, and, and with the little details, you know, the little – the little flipper scoop, the little swales cut out for your, yep. f- your flipper finger and, and the jimping on the flipper and the access to the, everything you mentioned. It just sounds, uh, yeah, like it makes that uh, a great knife. He, he did a great job. Uh, so another knife that I really, really like, and it is probably impossible to separate this knife from my belief about small knives and how small knives are what you really want is the, the TRM nerd. I love that knife. It is just. Like, you can carry that knife all day. It never gets in your way. It never screws up your stuff. And it just, it, it completely and totally disappears in your pocket. That's, that's a great knife. I, I, I just love, absolutely love that knife. And then I think I would put the last knife on this list. It's close. I would, I really like the Boost Blade Mini Smoke. I think that's like one of the best Spec Beast knives out there. You know, like, Spec Beasts are these things that like enthusiasts really get excited about when you see like, Oh, this is a three, three and a quarter inch blade and it weighs less than two ounces. Like, Oh my God. But you know, <laughs> a lot of those spec beast knives that you get, they turn out to be like the Bellatio knives. Have you ever had one of those? <laughs> no, I have not. Oh, they're terrible. They're terrible. Wait, wait. I, but what, what's the deal with those? Uh, someone just mentioned those recently and I hadn't heard of them up until then. So they are marketed at ultralight backpackers and they are supposed to be, you know, like the lightest possible locking knife you can make. So they'll have like a three inch knife that weighs like 0.78 ounces. And, you know, it's, it's as handy as a knife as, you know, the toothpaste, the toothbrush with the handle cut off. Right. right. It's just, it's terrible as a knife. It's terrible. So your, your term spec beast. Yeah. Uh, is, uh, I'm not sure if it's your term or if you're just using it, but that, that actually is, is the perfect term. And, and, uh, I mean, the, what, what you're referring to is not my wheelhouse. That's another term, spec right, right. And wheelhouse and all that. Right. My wheelhouse runs a little bit larger and, and just by aesthetic, a little more GER. But, um, yeah, hitting all those marks, the 3.1, uh, the three and a quarter inch blade. Uh, the, the under three ounces or th- around three ounces. It's, t- it's under two ounces. It's under. crazy. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. That's, yeah. that is crazy. Yeah. So, so, uh, before we wrap up, I want to find out uh, about the Gear Geeks live podcast. Yeah. Tell me about it. I, I, I know Nick and I know you. What's, what's the show like? So it originally started with, uh, it was Aaron Shapiro and I. And Andrew Jean, who ran Edge Observer. Do you remember Edge Observer? Yes. Yeah. His videos were awesome. Okay. Andrew Jean made the greatest product videos in the history of mankind. And I include in that, like, all of the amazing bullshit that you get out of the automotive industry. Like, his product videos are the greatest product videos ever. Um, so he and Aaron and I were on. And then Aaron rotated out because he was looking for a new house. And we brought in, uh, Andrew from 777 Gear. Mm-hmm. And then he rotated out and Dan, Dan from, uh, bladereviews.com came on. And then it was Dan, me and Andrew for a long time. And it was crazy. Like it was 
three and a half hours and we would get, you know, pretty roasted and we were just like, Andrew Gene is one of the funniest people on the planet. And some of the stuff that he would say, like, we tried to keep it live and not edit it, but there were quite a few times where I was like, you know, Dan would send me an email, be like, oh, Jesus, <laughs> Andrew went crazy. So, uh, Andrew, uh, eventually started working on, uh, he started working on a very successful line of comic book movies. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, he designed, uh, it, because of all of the stuff he did for his product photography, he designed, uh, dollies, mounts, and automated, uh, camera solutions. So, like, he designed, do you remember, uh, Chronicles of Riddick? Yes. So there's this famous shot in Chronicles of Riddick where they want to show you how desolate the landscape is. And it's a three, 360 degree shot around his body. Yeah. Andrew developed a rig that held the camera to do that. Wow. Yeah. So Andrew, Andrew, uh, ultimately, uh, went off to greener pastures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, he, and so then I, I, we had, um, uh, an opening and I was about ready to close it down. And it's been a real struggle because of my wife's uh, situation. But Nick jumped in and he did an episode with me and it just like clicked. Like Nick is Nick is one of the best people you will meet in life. Like he is not just an awesome knife dude, but he is one of the best human beings I know. And I really am lucky that he's a friend of mine. He, you know, like uh, my last year has been crazy with my wife being diagnosed with cancer. And one of the the best things was to be able to to chat with Nick about knives and, you know. Yeah. And so, that's what it is. It's just two guys who really like knives talking about nerdy stuff. You know, every once in a while, we'll have a guest on. Like, we had the lead designer, Seth, from Gerber on to talk about the fastball. And that was really fun. Episode 82 is probably the proudest moment of Gear Geeks Live. We had Michael Walker on. Oh, cool. And Michael Walker is the smartest guy it's it blows my mind that the things like he talked about the process for making a zipper blade and how how it takes you know eight hours of work seven days a week for three months to make a zipper. Blade. <laughs> <laughs> I'll like, take three, please. <laughs> it's just like a, I don't even understand how you could do that. I mean, like none of them are over four inches long. So he spends three year, three months on this thing, and then he said, you know, like a lot of the times after three months, you'll realize that the, that it didn't work, and that's oh. the only way to do it. So it, it's a fun podcast. It's it needs to be more regular, but you know, like I have two little boys. I started my own business. My wife had cancer. It's yeah. been crazy. So. It's a, well, it's a living record of your uh, your interest and uh, yes, and and your and and conversations with Nick. I mean, actually, it's it's not a surprise to me that the two of you uh, would hit it off. Not that I know either of you personally, though I've had a conversation with both of you. It's that you both have a very systematic, methodical way of going about your reviews and and uh, at looking at gear. And ultimately, I, I have to say, I think that's that's initially what drew me into uh, Nick, and that's what drew me into you too. Is each time I, I kind of know what to expect. I know what's going to be covered, and those are things that are uh, important to me. If they weren't, I would watch someone else like myself <laughs> who does not talk about any of that stuff. Uh, so, um, yeah, it, it's a, it's, a, I think it seems like a great combination. The, Nick, like I said, Nick is just one of the best dudes and he is really smart. Like, I, I think that it comes across in his videos, but I'm not sure people pick up on the extent to which, like, Nick can figure out just about anything that's mechanical. You give it to him, you give him two days and a screwdriver. And he'll tell you how it works. I, I, I had all these assumptions about him just from watching his videos. I was like, yeah, this guy, I, th I think he builds rockets. I don't know. <laughs> you know, like that's very, very He's really smart. He just seemed like a brilliant dude. Uh, so before we wrap, Anthony, I, I want to do a speed round with you. And these okay. are just single, single word answers. And uh, they're common questions that plague all of us type. And uh, I'm asking you to put it all on the line. This is like inside the actor's studio. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Okay. So, fixed or folder? Oh, God. Fixed. Okay. Flipper or thumb stud? Flipper. Washers or bearings? Washers. Tip up or tip down? Tip down. Tanto or Bowie? Oh, Bowie. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Hollow ground or flat ground? Flat ground. Full size or small? Small. Gentleman's knife or tactical knife? Gentleman's knife. Automatic or bally song? Whew, that one is tough. Jeez. 
my fingers hate me for saying this, but probably Balasong. I, I tried to do Balasong and I, I, I learned from a guy that took Filipino martial arts and I cut the shit out of my fingers. <laughs> then he taught you wrong, brother. <laughs> well, he taught me right. I just couldn't do it. Oh, uh, I'm not well, very there's that. Yeah, I'm not very coordinated. ZT or we? Ooh, right now we is firing on all cylinders. Okay, so we. Benchmate or Hogue? Oh, geez. I have to give a small edge to Hogue. Their edges, their out of the box edges are insane. Yes, yes. And, and their able lock is pretty sweet too. Yes, they did a really good job with that. So I don't know if you have a take on this, but real steel or steel will. Two I confuse all the time. <laughs> Me too. Um, <laughs> whoever made the metamorph. Okay, that's real steel metamorph. Yes, yeah. I'm with you. Milled titanium or spring clip? Oh, spring clip every day. Carbon fiber or micarta? Micarta every day. Finger choil or no choil? Finger choil. Form or function? Function. Okay, now desert island knife, and that's one knife for the rest of your life. It doesn't have to be to survive on a desert island. It's just the last knife you get to have. Okay, so it would probably be the BK-16, the KBR BK-16. If I had to choose a folder, it would be the Spidey Chef. The Spidey Chef? Yes, that knife does it all. I mean, like, I've taken it to the ocean. I've submerged it in water. It's perfectly fine. I used it to cut up grapes for my babies. I used it to, uh, you know, make fire sticks for camping. I've used it to, you know, open packages all day long. Uh, during COVID, I have carried it a lot more because I just wanted to slather everything in sanitizer. It has taken it. It is incredibly sharp. It's ergonomic and weird in all the ways that a design nerd would like a knife. So, I mean, it's just one of my favorite knives ever. But the BK-16 is the knife that you – if I only had one knife, that's it. I mean, it's just so freaking good. The BK-16. Well, I have to say that the Spidey Chef, uh, I, I've had one since they first came out. And it has aged so beautifully. I mean, it is one of my smoothest knives. Oh, yeah. And and just the way that surface of, of that titanium has snail trailed and just, mm, it's so sumptuous how it's aged. And I have an old leather th fob on it, so it looks like something that's been around. <laughs> because that's what matters. I'm kind of a shallow guy. Hey, uh, Anthony, how can people catch up with you, Everyday Commentary? How can they find your work? So I write for Gear Junkie and I try to write one or two articles a month for Gear Junkie. So that's gearjunkie.com. You can also read the website and I publish one article every week and I have for the last 10 years. And that's everydaycommentary.com. There you can find links to the, the YouTube and the Twitter feeds. I was not going to say the YouTube, like that. <laughs> the, the, the Twitter feeds and the YouTube feeds. Uh, I'm everyday comment on uh, Twitter and everyday commentary on YouTube and Instagram. Well, Anthony School and Brini, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a real pleasure uh, diving in and, and finding out what makes you tick and uh, to find out about your recent article and to find out about your channel. It's It's been a pleasure. Thank you. This was a ton of fun. I do realize that it makes me sound like I have some sort of mental health diagnosis coming my way, but <laughs> that's fine. Hey, I'm man. Okay. We all do. That's why we're here. It's that's okay. why it's the junkie, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. All righty, sir. Have a good one. All right. Thanks. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. All right, Bob, back on the Knife Junkie Podcast. A great interview, like you said, uh, very uh, well-spoken, well-thought-out, uh, great uh, interview, I thought, and uh, a, a lot more than just the article that you guys talked about. Yeah, and actually, if you if you go to the Everyday Commentary uh, website and you and you look at Anthony's uh, past, he's gotten a number of degrees and uh, the final, and you know he's a, he's a lawyer, and so uh, all of that education funneled through the ability to analyze and speak that a lawyer has. I, I think that's what makes for a magic combination in his uh, in his reviews and analysis. And I love the combination of him and Nick Shabazz. It's a uh, it's a very uh, heady kind of combination right so. right the gear geeks live podcast of course we'll have links to that as well as everyday commentary in the show notes that you can find at the knife slash 126 the knife slash 126 
And I uh, really enjoyed the part of the interview where he was talking about the couple of the cases that he litigated that involved knives and, uh, you know, how appropriate that he was that uh, person's lawyer. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that. It it just occurred to me as I was speaking to him that his uh, you know his hero status kept rising as I was talking to him. Like <laughs> right. first I just thought, wow, this is a smart guy, and then it was like, oh, and he's saved some knife people among us. Well, again, the Sunday interview show is where we get a chance to meet folks in the knife world, and of course we do this show every week, and then midweek it's our supplemental episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. So a couple of chances for you to hear us on audio. And then Thursday Night Knives with Bob live on video on his YouTube channel, theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. We'll hope you'll uh, join us this Thursday for Thursday Night Knives. So for Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim the Knife Newbie Person saying thanks for joining us on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.